It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. What's up, everybody? Oh, exciting show today. Long time coming because of hashtag dad life. But welcome to Mean Age Daydream. I'm always your host, Brian McWilliams. But I'm joined today by a very special man, a beautiful man, some would argue, uh, Latinx comedian, Loop Arez. Welcome to the show, Loop. Very, very happy to be here. This is the, um, I love the uh, the graphic. Um, oh, you like which one? The the Lions of Liberty with the flaming uh, the flaming line, or the Mean Age Daydream with my Bowie head? I, I I'm <laughs> digging the Bowie, especially with your with your scalp cut open, oh, but but not in a violent That's, way. I just no uh, no a, a subtle gentle way. Well, this is how you know, like Major Tom. I came back from space, and they uh, the aliens dissected me. They took off the top of the head, put all sorts of shit in there, and and here we are. Here we're at. Here we are. Well, let's hear yeah. some of that shit. We're gonna we're gonna get to it. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get into it, baby. Well, yeah, guys, you obviously, most of you know Lou Perez, a uh, buddy of mine, love Lou to death. He's a comedian. Of course, Lou is also now an author. A lot has happened. A lot has happened over the pandemic, Lou. There it is. The joke that, uh, that joke isn't funny anymore, uh, which I loved. I have read it. I look forward to getting into it. And by the way, could the timing be more perfect for this, for us to talk about this book, considering the first few chapters with Chappelle on SNL, and Donald Trump announcing his candidacy. Dude, it I, I gotta tell you, when the book was finally in the hands of the of of uh my publisher, right? And you're just waiting, like, okay, we're gonna they're gonna go and do check for typos and stuff. I was in a position where it seemed like every week a new comedian was dying. Not a new comedian, a, com a comedian was dying, like a like a comedian whose work I absolutely loved. But it was like yeah, Norm Louis Anderson, right? Norm McDonald, uh, Norm, uh, Norm oh, Bob Norm. Saget. It just it, it was just like, and I was like, please get this fucking book out before more comedians die. Yeah. And then I and then at the, like, like sort of around that same time, that's when the slap happened. That's when when Will Smith hopped up on stage and slapped Chris Rock for making a G.I. Jane joke at the expense of his gorgeous fucking wife. And mm -hmm. people and I, like the amount of people are like, dude, you got to write about this. And I'm like, I just want this book to be out, man. Like, just stop. <laughs> if just everything could just stop and just let me get this book out. And then, yeah, just like you say, like, here we are. Like, are we going back in time or it's, is this? Yeah, it feels like it. Right. I mean, you know, hopping. Well, actually, no, hold up. Before we get into the book, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you how you're doing as a, as a dad, as a lover, as a fighter, because, you know, I, and I'd ask you this because, you know, everything that's going on and it ties, it ties into kind of everything in life right now. We're fathers, right? Coming at us. How do you feel about things? Are you, are you concerned about the future? Are you worried about the, the trends, things, uh, the way things are going? Are you more inspired to change the world now having two kids that are, uh, walking around just waiting to be punched in the face that's it no that's a good question i think something that i noticed about uh becoming a dad i became a dad during during the pandemic and i think it's when i talked to you and marka uh, on my podcast was around that yeah. time it was amazing just how small the world became you know where it was like uh you know issues that were that are just i, I realize like there are issues that are just way bigger than me just stuff I, I have like absolutely no control over but what i have some control over is this little world this little tribe that i've that that, that i've made you know my mm -hmm. wife and my kid and it's uh continued with a with our second so you know my world is a lot a lot smaller um and i think a lot happier when it is a, a lot smaller and then i need to be reminded of the madness every time that i go like online and i'm like <laughs> oh wow like there's a lot of shit happening around me that I have no clue about until I turn on my little box. And yeah. then, and then I think it's, uh, you know, there's an opportunity there to start, uh, you know, to start worrying. Um, but I think, you know, overall, I'm, uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty hopeful uh, for the future. I remember I had a, a fan of mine reached out a while back and asked me if I was, you know, if I was hopeful 
And I said, you know, being a, a new dad and stuff, I'm like, I don't really have a choice. You know, it's sort of like yeah. you're in this position where uh, if you don't have hope, well, you got to create your own hope. You know, you yeah. got to whatever it takes for you to, you know, uh, to make that next step in life or to get out of bed and all that. You got to do it because there's no other alternative. You know, well, I mean, the, al the alternative is become a, a climate activist. That's the alternative, <laughs> right? When you have yeah. when you have no hope, then you become a climate activist Dude, convinced that you shouldn't have children because the world's going to end. And how could you do that to a child? I, I don't want to. Yeah, I want to. I want to throw soup on the masterpieces <laughs> of you know of 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 of, of art. I want to uh, glue my hand to the walls next to it. I'm actually. I, I was trying to figure. <laughs> I'm like, I can't wait till one of them just like paints one of those masterpieces with their own brains, you know, oh. like, like if you really want to make a fucking statement, then, you know, we're talking about, you know, blasting the back of your head op open yeah. and onto That's a, a movement I can get behind, man. I, you know, it's like, you've, you've one chapter in the book called commit. I think the chapter is called commit, right? And you're talking about, <laughs> you know, commit to commit to what you believe in, you know, all these, all these hypocrites out there in the world. And none of them seem to be really committing to it. Cause really, is there any more pussy way to be an activist other than to go into a museum where hey, what's who's going to stop you a 75 right. year old who stands around all day long, you know, just kind of admiring artwork. They're not going to do shit. So what more pussy way can you go about uh, protesting than to glue yourself to a work of art, knowing that literally nothing is going to happen to you. It's the least at uh, the least uh, volatile environment you could possibly protest in. Yeah. And, and also, you know, like, these people have, like, no idea just how unliked they are, just how, oh. hate, like, how hated they are. And they're Setting doing, the movement back? Yeah, yeah. And they're doing these things that are just going to make them even more hated, you know, like, like choosing the, those targets. I mean, what would be worse than that, like, what, going to, like, Disneyland and, like, you know, throwing what paint on, on like, Mi Mickey and Minnie Mouse in front of a family yeah. and stuff? And I'm just thinking, like, you know... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing, but, but yeah, we like the idea you're going to change the world by fucking up some Van, Van Gogh's, Van Gogh's, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, they, they continue. And it's the fact that these people are so uninspired too. The first one, I actually gave it credit, right? I work in public relations. I gave it credit because <laughs> the message, right? I know it is funny to think about, but I'm very good. But no, the message I got, right? Okay, you guys are putting these paintings, you're honoring these paintings, you're preserving these paintings, but you're not preserving humanity. All right, salient point, fine, one time. One time, that's a salient point. It's like Spider-Man and uh, Family Guy. Everybody gets one time that you get saved, you know? After that, it's like you said, it's obnoxious. It's turning people against you. And all it's gonna do is make people now, like I said, it was the safest environment other, to, other than going to a kitten farm and gluing yourself to kittens. Now, I bet you're gonna see people getting beaten up at museums. It's kind of like the Antifa Proud Boys thing. Oh my right? God, I was, I was just about to say, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna start seeing the Proud Boys <laughs> right. at, the Met, at the Met, just, you know, like holding shit down. Every oh every God. heavy work of art has got a Captain America shield holding Proud Boy, yeah. uh, you know, with a gas mask on and a bat. I, I hope to yeah. see it. Now we're gonna see like just a bunch of illustrations of like, you know, Da Vinci, uh, you know, calling people a cuck. And stuff right, yeah, like, that. like they're just gonna t <laughs> totally take that. No, it's hilarious. <laughs> so let's get into a little bit more of the book proper. So you know, you and I talked about we were at Freedom Fest, just kind of shooting the shit at the bar about the book. But and I want you to keep this brief because you've done other interviews, so I don't want to bore people that I might have heard before. But tell me a little bit about the genesis of what went into the book, and then I want to jump into talking about Chappelle and uh, and Trump and getting into the pushback he's gotten and the shake your head sadness of Donald Trump now being the focus of every hack comedian. Yeah. So um, the, the book came out of an article I wrote in the wall street journal called how I became a quote, far right radical. And uh, that article was in response to an academic pre-published paper. I think that was the, uh, uh, the status of it called, um, uh, the, the growth of right wing echo chambers on YouTube. So you had very highly educated people from very large institutions who got paid money to, I guess, check out YouTube videos. You know, it's amazing, <laughs> like where, you know, where 
where research and uh, where research goes. Um, and part of their study, uh, they would categorize all these different uh, YouTube channels. So it was like almost like a thousand channels. And they had like far left, left, center, right, uh, and far right. And my old comedy channel, We the Internet TV, was listed on the far right section. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. Um, and also listed there, we had like uh, the Joe Rogan experience, Sam Harris, Brett Weinstein. And you're like, I don't, when I think of far right, you know, I think of like, you know, tiki torch carrying khaki pants wearing literal you know. Nazis. Yeah. Is yeah far right. A, yeah. Like people yeah. that want society, Richard Spencer style, like white, white people uh, living on their own voluntary yeah. or not. You could describe as far right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not me or these, uh, or these other people. <laughs> and, um, but the more I looked into these channels, the more appealing their message became. So. You know, thank you, YouTube for directing me <laughs> to, uh, to the truth. Um, <laughs> So I had, a, I had a, a friend of mine who, you know, said, you know, you know, you should write a, you should write a response or do a video response. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more pissed off I got because I had recently lost my job and I'm like, I'm going to be sending out my resume. And if people are associating Lou Perez with, you know, this far right channel, it's like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm fucked. Um, so, uh, so I, I wrote that it, it ran in the, in the wall street journal and, um, uh, I, I was friends with a, uh, a, a publisher on, on Facebook. We became Facebook friends uh, well before this. And we just knew each other through, you know, like liking each other's posts and, and that sort of thing. And I, and I thought, you know what would be cool if, like, if I sent him this article and he responded with, oh, you should write a book. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so I sent him the article. He read it and said, you should write a book. And then from there, we started, you know, the process of, of, of writing a book. And it was... Uh, it's my first book. I, I'd never written one before. Um, and uh, I said, I asked him like, you know, what do you, you know, you know, what kind of book do you want me to write? You know, what do you, you know, what, what do you want to see? And he's like, write the book you want to write, which is incredibly like, it's incredible opportunity, like how freeing, but also, holy shit, what do you mean? I got to write the book I want to write. Like, right. I don't know what the fuck yeah. I want to write. I don't even know if I have a book in me. What, what's going on? Um, but then, you know, eventually uh, it's, it's, it's what you uh, held in your hands at one point. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and it is, I will say the book, I really enjoyed it. It is, it's funny, it's poignant. It, it was interesting because, as you said, you could tell it's it's kind of, um, it kind of goes everywhere. It's, you know, it, it's basically a book of, of shorter essays. It's tied together with an overarching theme, but it is definitely different topics jumping on different essays. There's some great jokes in it. You know, there's one that I, that uh, cracked me up uh, when I wrote it down. Uh, Fuck. It was basically a joke about libertarians and the Holocaust, uh, which, you know, <laughs> yeah, get you canceled immediately. But it was why do libertarians hate the Holocaust? Because it was state uh, state undertaken other than private or free market. Basically, and I'm butchering your own joke and I apologize. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I do it. I, I'm, I, I am. Uh, I, I am honored. So yeah, but no, but but you know the book's littered with with very funny one liners. It reads fast, which is great. You know, I mean, it really is. A, it, it's because you don't want to put it down. It's a very funny read, and I actually like the way it was broken up into the short chapters because it did make it much more uh, accessible and a little less dense. So I got to fix my lighting. But the sun's going down next to me in my office. Um, so getting into the book, you start off with talking about a lot of, as we said, a lot of topics that are just right in the news right now. I mean, first off, do you, let's start off by talking about Dave Chappelle, because I wanted to wait until I had you on. Now, un unfortunately, the way it worked out, this will air on the 30th, but it's still going to be very relevant. Dave Chappelle has the highest ratings as predicted. The show was great. His monologue was hilarious. And to one of the points you make in the book, when you talk about clapter versus laughter, I legitimately laughed out loud to numerous jokes in his monologue that I did not agree with him on from a fundamental standpoint. One example I'll give is Ukraine, right? He's talking about how the Ukrainians, they were these fighters, they're you know so inspired, good for them, all this stuff, which you know, in my mind, I think that our support of the Ukrainian fighters is uh, you know, almost a war crime to keep their, their country being bombed. But he had a great joke about how they killed 10,000 Russians in the first week before we'd given them all these arms and joked about how every house in Ukraine must have been set up like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. <laughs> and the Russians are just dying by grabbing fucking boiling hot uh, doorknobs. But point being, his comedy transcends 
simply agree, disagree, and he's willing to say things that will, in fact, get him canceled. So what is your take? Did you see the monologue? Do you know? You know, you know what? I didn't see the monologue. I didn't I didn't watch it. And it, I think with, with Chappelle, it's one of those things because he puts out so much material. Too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this dude, you know, I, I remember what, what was it? The uh, um, the special that he he did at the comedy store like it seemed like it was only like a couple of months after the special he had done previously yeah. in yeah. DC. And, you know, this dude can get up on stage and, you know, you know, easily, you know, get 45, 50 minutes out, you know, just, just riffing. Yeah. Um, so he, he puts out so much material and then I'm usually late to it in that, like, I, I don't, I don't end up watching it until someone until there's controversy and basically right, all yeah, the stuff he does I, is controversy. I'm the, I'm the same to be honest. Yeah, I mean it should be appointment viewing because he is one of the greatest living comedians. But I'm just like you. And again, blame dad life for it. It's hard to find time to do much of anything. But, but be, yeah, no, no, but but even that joke that that you know that, that you you just um, told about like his take on Ukraine. Like I'm like, who the fuck would ever? think home alone right ukraine and, <laughs> and bring those together and it's like that's hilarious you know and i think that i think a big part of the success there is 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 the surprise factor you know mm -hmm. where it's like oh i didn't know where he was necessarily necessarily going to go with this you know but uh you know but but here we are um and you know i think that's a really important thing when we're talking about when we're talking about comedy it's it's you know do I see this punchline, you know, a mile yeah. away, or is this something that's really going to, uh, um, that, that that's going to surprise me? Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish, uh, I wish I had watched uh, the monologue. I'm, I'm, I'm probably right after this, I will, and then you're going to be like, dude, why didn't you do great, it? Great work. Ten Lou. minutes Wait, yeah, before. Then you'll do a podcast. You can do a podcast on this podcast, adding yeah. an additional commentary. <laughs> um, so I, I know that a lot of people were commenting on, I guess, uh, with, the, the Jews. Jewish jo the, yeah, yeah, the Jews yeah. or Jew jokes or something like that. Yeah, the, the, what, what the predominant on? one, I'll, I'll just do a, a quick recap because I don't know, the people in the audience may not have seen it either. It basically was something where he had a few, a few really pertinent lines about Jews in Hollywood, joking about how, yes, you know, the Jews, in fact, do and control much of the entertainment industry, but you can't talk about it. Uh, the one joke that people are, are repeating is that if you have a group of blacks, it's called a gang. If you have a group of Italians, it's called a mob. If you have a group of Jews, well, that's just a coincidence and you can't talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just a, it's a funny line. And he goes on to, to joke about Kyrie Irving and Kanye West and, and all that kind of thing. Um, but he also you know, makes fun of at the same time. He's talking about uh, Herschel Walker, making fun of Herschel Walker and how he's observably stupid, I think it is a line that he uses. So he's mm -hmm. making fun of black candidates as well. He's making fun of black culture, being a little bit self-deprecating, as I think is so important in comedy, to if you're going to, as you say, punch up or punch down. And I want to talk about this topic because you spend a lot of time talking about punching up and punching down the book. And I think it's a very good point to talk about, especially with current comedy. He punches up and punches down at the same time while also self, you know, immolating in a little way. And I think that that's something that is so underratedly important to get people on your side and to realize that, okay, they're not just trying to sell me something here. This person acknowledges they are human. They're flawed. They're just as stupid as me. They're just trying to get me, you know, tell me a joke. They're trying to make me laugh. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder, um, because like, I guess, you know, a lot of the anti-Semitic tropes have, you know, been, um, uh, you know, in the news recently, like, like with Kanye and, and all that. And I don't know if I'm the only one that that's like tweeted out, you know, something to the effect of, you know, uh, you know, something that anti-Semites need to know is that it's not the Jews fault that you're fucking losers. <laughs> you know, it's like, I wish more people would just talk about that. It's like, oh, you know, all, you know, all these, you know you know all these conspiracy theories and this is the cabal and that you know and they're controlling us. That, that is no excuse for you being a fucking loser <laughs> you know and um i don't know i, I actually I, i'm waiting for you know some of my, my my jewish brothers and sisters to rise up and be like yeah we control shit motherfucker we're gangster you know <laughs> right yeah, you know, they, they, take, you take think ownership of it in a way you know yeah i i swear i was just talking about this with a buddy of mine that i was at the oscars museum right the academy uh, museum in hollywood went in there and it's just a, as woke as you could imagine. I remember it pissed me off because there's a statue or, or this big matte painting of Mount Rushmore from North by Northwest, right? Famous iconic film, big Mount Rushmore matte paintings in the background of this old film. And I go up to a plaque on the wall 
and I go and read the plaque. Yeah, and I go, wow, what's this? There's going to be some information about this uh, this painting? No, no. It was a plaque telling me that the land Mount Rushmore was on was stolen from the Native Americans. Was it Blackfoot? Like a Blackfoot Indian? Uh, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Did you yeah. see, did you read the same plaque? <laughs> no, I, I remember, no, I remember in college um, reading an essay uh, about that. It was about Mount Rushmore and it was, yeah. you know, specifically about um you know the land that that was uh that was taken yeah well they made it very clear hey, you know obviously tons to do with the movies but the entire museum right you think about the history of the entertainment complex look it is jews it's wall-to-wall jews and you'd think they'd want to be proud of that but it almost seems buried in the museum which i thought was so strange they're highlighting every other diversity every other people that have you know contributed meanwhile downplaying that yes, Jewish people built a lot of the entertainment business. You should be proud of that, you know. To mm-hmm. point, hey, yeah, banking, good job, you know. <laughs> it's you know, it's just it's funny to see the outrage uh, selectively applied. But you know, to Chappelle's point, he does joke about how you cannot cross that line. It's one of those absolute, you know. Now it's hate speech. Mm-hmm. The Anti Defamation League will come after you, uh, you know, for everything and anything. And it it is without a doubt a chill factor. I'd say more than anything else, it, it seems the Jews do wield a, a disproportionate amount of cancel power. I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to think of how Nick Cannon got out of that. You know, Nick Cannon seems yeah, to have gotten. Right. Yeah. Well, well, we have Nick Cannon. He's 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 done pretty well. Jesse Jackson has done pretty well. Jesse he Jackson has. of uh of uh, what was it Heimie Town? Uh, I believe that's what actually, called New York. Yeah, Al, you know, I actually know why. Sharpton. I, <laughs> it was Sharpton getting shot. Well, I was going to say Nick Cannon got out of it because he's like, look. I'm just going to keep fucking and having kids. So there's no, ch- there's no chance to come after me because everybody has to keep, keep sending up to gifts for having a new baby. Congratulations on the new baby. Now let's talk about your anti-Jewish set. Congrats on the new baby. Now c- congrats on the new baby. You know? <laughs> yeah. He's got, I, that would be cool if Nick Cannon just made like the switch to like, to be um, like Hasidic. That would be amazing. Like, be he's amazing. already got, you know, already has a lot of kids and nope. all that. No, it's, it's really, uh, I, I don't know. It's, well, I, I think, you know, historically speaking, you know, I can understand um, the, you know, the ickiness of it. I mean, you know, because the, you know, over the centuries, you know, pogroms and, and, and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, but, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know. It, it is kind of weird that it, it, like, like it's in the atmosphere now, like it's in the zeitgeist, you know, it's mm-hmm. like you have all these different prominent black figures talking about, uh, talking about Jews. Uh, I don't know. It it's, is, it is almost, well, like I said, it almost becomes self, a self perpetuating cycle, right? Because you've got, if you have one massive celebrity like Kanye West, right? Who was like the center of the universe for black culture for a long time talking about it. And you've got, you know, Kyrie uh, Irving in the NBA, of course, you know, he's a superstar. And it's almost one of those things where you go, okay, now once the attention is paid, you comb through and you look for other instances that are going to be played up and social media would tie into that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it, and, and it seems like, you know, it, uh, yeah, it just starts feeding, you know, you know, feeding uh, itself. Um, um, yeah. And, or is it feeding itself? I don't know if it's feeding itself. Um, well, well, I think, I think also, you know, there's questions about, um, you know, what are, what's the proper punishment, you know, right, yeah. should, should these people be punished, um, you know, in, in certain way, what, what sort of public shaming is, um, you know, is necessary. And I think we, you know, we live in a weird time with cancel culture where we see, you know, people, you know, lose careers over very minimal stuff. Right. You know, there, there's that example of, I think his last name was Shore, um, who lost his job for, I think he just like shared an article saying, uh, that uh, uh, post riots, uh, like basically riots, aren't good for when it comes to mm-hmm. uh, you know, what ch- changing elected when it comes to elected officials or, or something yeah. like that. Like they don't actually have a, a yeah, positive he was, he was academia, change in politics. Think, right? Yeah, and yeah. you know he ended up losing his job. So it's sort of like you see that, and then you have you know guys coming out basically, you know the the year twenty twenty two version of the protocols of the elders of Zion, and it's mm-hmm. sort of okay, what, you know, what do we, what do we do with that? You know, I guess I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, you know, in a fortunate position where I think they, you know, sort of lend themselves to an opportunity for public mockery, 
you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so there, so there's something about that. And, and, and I think, I think too, like I, what, you know, what this has sort of brought out and um, uh, a friend of mine, David Marcus, he wrote uh, a piece. Did it run in the post, the New York post? I'm not sure. Um, but saying that, you know, these examples of, you know, of Kanye and, and, um, and, and Irving talking about this, you know, it's sort of the elephant in the room that people don't want to talk about the relationship between blacks and Jews and mm -hmm. the antagonistic relationship, especially in, in, yeah. uh, in, in recent years. I mean, you know, the amount of hate crimes that are being pepper, uh, uh, perpetrated in New York, for example, mm -hmm. against the Hasidic community by, uh, you know, predominantly like, you know, black males, you know, it's really disconcerting. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and a lot of, of what's underneath that is this conspiratorial, you know, uh, you know, positioning of they're taken over, they're trying right. to push us out. Our problems are their fault, you know. So and I, that's so been, I think, well, and that's been classic, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for, yeah. Throughout time, blaming the Jews has been a very popular way to uh, to offset the ills of whatever yeah. society you're in. Simply blame somebody else, and and it happened to be the Jews for. Again, you know, I think there's probably reasons for that based in banking where resentful of success, resentful of having, you know, people of power and owing money, but a convenient scapegoat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, yeah, I think, you know, sort of where we are is there's a lot sort of under the surface that people don't want to don't don't want to talk about. Um, no. And as much as, you know, say, um, you know, uh, the, these black figures might want to talk about the role that the Jews played in the slave trade 400 years ago, they mm -hmm. might not want to talk about, well, the amount of fucking anti-Semitic violent attacks being done today against innocent people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah so, no, it's, 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 so it's like, it's a lot of ugliness, you know, all over the, all over the place. Um, but if you can craft a good joke about it, shit. Yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, let's talk about Trump now. So Trump just declared he will be running. What do you think about that? And you talk about how Donald Trump had, and I agree your sentiment completely in this, had essentially ruined comedy in many ways because he was, it, it's too easy to make the joke. The joke writes itself. The man is quite literally a walking satire of himself and of power and of New York City. He's back. Yeah, I, what are your I, thoughts? <laughs> like I, I almost can't believe that that he is back, you know, I, like, yeah. um, I don't understand what, what's going on with like the January 6th stuff, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, lawsuits coming up in New York. And I, it just seems like there's a lot going on that I, I, I don't know how you're able to, you know, run a campaign, you know, with all yeah. that stuff, um, you know, with all that stuff going on. Um, I, I mean, don't. he has. He was able to run his last campaign while I think it was he, he was banging prostitutes. He was p getting peed or accusing Obama. Of, or no, he was getting peed on, right? Uh, in Russian apartments. And the man clearly is a multitasker. <laughs> He's can't a underestimate. Multi <laughs> you know, that's that's something that you, you're right. You can't underestimate him. I, I mean, you know, the guy's in his seventies. I, I think it was. I think it was Joe Rogan who, who brought it up. Who was saying like the guy's in his seventies. He eats shit. He eats like <laughs> garbage. You know, like he's this super wealthy guy who is no problem just eating like fast food and and I'm sure there's candy involved. And yet, oh. and yet somehow, I mean, he, you know, he has the stamina to you know be on the road to go and speak in front of you know thousands of people in a given night and entertain them. You know, um, he's. I mean, he really isn't like anything that we had ever seen, especially to reach that level, you know, to, of, of the presidency. Um, yeah. Who knows what the fuck is going to happen? I, I, you know, I do wonder if, uh, um, if he's going to be sort of like the saving grace on for like Twitter. You know, is he going to come yeah. back? Is he going to come back in Twitter? Because you know, it it seems like, you know, who knows what where Twitter Twitter will be in the next few months. Um, you know, all these people were saying we're, we're getting out of here and all that. But man, if this dude comes back to Twitter, it's like you got to stay. Right. I mean, oh, you, yeah, you, you you have to stay and see what the fuck he will be say. back. He will be back. I, I don't think Donald Trump's foolish enough 
to forgo that massive built-in audience. And for every person that's on Truth Social, they're also on Twitter. I can yeah. promise you that. So he would be a fool not to not to come back. It would be massive for the platform, obviously. But have you, I mean, let me ask you this. So you know, talking about pure comedy. I'm just, I'm dreading what's to come because number one, I don't know what else you can say that's new about Donald Trump that right. hasn't been said, but you know, these people will all focus on Donald Trump as the butt of every joke. And I also wonder, has there ever been an instance where in the majority of the time, the people or the person that's being made fun of is actually probably telling funnier jokes in front of his crowds than the comedians are telling in front of theirs. No, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. There, there, there's one comedian um, who, when it comes to Trump stuff, who I'm, 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 I'm thankful exists. And that's uh, JL Coven. And, um, I don't know if, if, if you know JL. No, um, no, I don't. Yeah, he's it, he's phenomenal. Like, not only does he do like a Donald Trump, he also does a Donald Trump Jr. Um, he does a Mitch McConnell and like really fucking well. And, and with the Trump stuff in particular, he, I, I worry about him because he gets so, it's like he's in the brain of Trump that I'm wondering. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, oh shit, is he going to get stuck there? And he does bits with it, like on Don, Donald Trump Jr. that are fantastic. And JL, I think, is just a real. He's very out of the ordinary when it comes to doing material about Trump. His mm. stuff is legitimately original, hilarious, and taking it places that you know you, you didn't think, you know, you, you didn't think it could go. Yeah. Um, now the other ninety nine percent of people working in comedy yeah it's going to be the same stuff isn't it i mean it's just gonna it's gonna be uh if a junk doesn't if, if a if a junk if a joke doesn't land you know it'll go back to uh you know uh racist mm -hmm. uh, sexist you know all that you know all that stuff fascist you know we're gonna go uh uh you know it's just gonna be the same the, the same shit that we heard for you know four plus years before that yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, let me ask this. So you talked a little bit, talking about racist stuff. You talk about Ibram X. Kendi in the book and also how you point out the fact that, you know, Ibram X. Kendi obviously comes from a very privileged background as far as it goes. His parents are both intellectuals and academics. And, but you talk about that Ibram himself is actually not that intelligent of a person. And it made me start thinking about, you know, it's kind of like this positioning in our current age of people that are not that inspiring that are not that intelligent basically imbeciles and really positioning <laughs> them as experts and ibram's an example i don't know if you know who dylan mulvaney is he's that oh I've, expert i've been seeing yeah i've been seeing uh stuff and look i've only had one beer so i'm you can't oh yeah you can't trick me dylan. no no i don't <laughs> i'm not gonna trick you to getting canceled this time well i just i did a i did a podcast with robbie the fire and uh we were oh, talking Robbie's about great. Oh, oh Robbie, yeah, funny. hilarious, man. Love Robbie. So uh, we were talking about Dylan Mulvaney, though, and he, we watched some of these videos, right? And he's a girlhood expert. It's a, a boy who's now transitioning to become a girl. It's literally, it looks like a kids in the hall sketch. It's that cringy and that ridiculous in that what he does is a caricature of a ditzy girl that you would not want to be around. And yet he is the expert in this space so you know what are your thoughts on that are we are well, we in an era of imbeciles as experts well i'm just i'm just imagining how annoying it would be being around a ditzy girl with a cock like that would, <laughs> that would just be the worst like oh my god <laughs> you know at least like you know like when you're single and you're like okay if i get through this date at least you know maybe there's some you know maybe there's some action some... at the end of it at this at, at the end of the dylan one i don't know about that <laughs> there's nothing good coming your way yeah um well yeah it 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 is wild uh like I say, you know, going like the Ibram X. Kendi thing um, in his book, he admits that, you know, he barely broke a thousand on his SAT yeah. and he really didn't think that he was, you know, college material, you know, and the lesson that he drew, he drew off, he drew from that was, uh, you know, intelligence is subjective and it's as subjective as beauty. I think that's how he, that's how he put it. And I was I was thinking about my own experience at that time, you know, being in high school and I I got like a 1360 or 1390 on my on my SAT. And I was thinking, you know, looking back, I probably could have gotten I probably could have broke 1400 um, if I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, if I studied harder, you know, all of that. At no point did I ever think, uh, you know, oh, the only reason why I didn't break you know, 1400 is because this test 
is against me, you know, yeah. or it's, it wasn't made for people like me. It's just like, no, like, you know, the test is the test. I'm limited in my own abilities and Hey, whatever, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'll never be a person who got a 1600 big deal, move on. But you have all, you have these people like, like Kendi who say, well, well, if I, if I barely broke a thousand, it must be because there is systemic racism involved. Yeah, it can't in be my fault. Yeah. It can't be that I'm not that smart of a person. Um, and, um, yeah, I think we see a lot of that, you know, it's sort of the, uh, um what's the term midwits i think uh, yeah exactly yeah there's a lot of midwits and well there's also something else that i enjoyed in the book you talk about this you know this diversity matrix i can't remember what the exact name of it was it's the the wheel of diversity you know give it a spin place your bets the wheel of diversity and all these different people at intersectionality of grievances right and you argue that you know really the majority of things that that people probably have in common the the biggest uh identifier really should be just being stupid. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Stupidity as an identity. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's um, the chapter is a stupid representation. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'm actually I'm actually gonna try to that's one of my that's one of my absolute thing. favorite chapters, by the way. It's Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, over on uh, page 149 is where it begins. Yeah. And um, for those of you who are you know who have uh, video footage, uh, where is the matrix? Let me see. It's got yeah, there it is. Yeah, there's the there's the, the footage. Actually, you know what? I have I could probably bring it up. I've got the PDF. Yeah. Let me try to, I'll bring up the PDF and we can reference it in real time here, Lou, because uh, yeah. keep, so, keep talking and I'll find Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll run off some of the things. So this is a um, privilege and society normatives, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in this circle, you have, um, what would that be? Is that the X axis is domination, right? So uh, you have, uh, Let's see, male and masculine, female and feminine, white, European heritage, heterosexual, wealth, uh, financial stability, non-disabled, credentialed, young, attractive. <laughs> All that stuff is at the top of the domination uh, uh, you know, axes. And right. then under there is gender deviance, female, black minority, ethnic people non-european uh, origin lgbtq just all this stuff unattractive is there old is there i mean just thinking about this like isn't it a little <laughs> fucked up that like you know a black minority ethnic uh, person has to be like kind of in the same category as like right. unattractive it's like that's pretty <laughs> fucked up uh, because they're because they're a gorgeous uh, you know people of all races oh, of course um and yeah, but it, and something that I noticed when I was looking at this fucking thing, I was like, man, there's no, there's no stupidity there. Yeah. There's no like, okay, you're, you know, you're white, you're cis, you're straight, whatever, but you're also really fucking stupid. <laughs> right. And, and to the same effect, it's not like, okay, you're brown, you're a woman and you're a fucking dunce. Right. As if that quality has no impact whatsoever yeah. on on your life or how you navigate the world or how on your how on your success you. yeah on your success on level your success. on your ability to to increase your socioeconomic status your influence on those around you yeah, yeah. exactly exactly yeah uh, and, um, th th there's a uh, there's a guy um, uh, academic Wilfred Riley uh, oh I love who, yeah love yeah, Wilfred Riley he's great. great he's great he's a great follow on on Twitter and um, I, I haven't read his report but I think he did a study. Um, you know, basically breaking down like 10, uh, you know, characteristics of success or privilege, you know, and, you know, when you, um, uh, you know, you have, you know, race in there, but then you also have intelligence, you have height, you have, uh, you have, you know, a good looks and all that. And it's like, a lot of people want it to just be, oh, this is the one Mm -hmm. variable you know on whether or not i have privilege or i'm going to succeed and it's like no nah, there's a lot more there's a lot more to it and anybody who you know is being honest is able to uh, is able to admit that yeah no exactly right man um let me ask you this question we, uh, we talk about at one point you talk about the necessity of hate speech why with i which i agree with um we talk about online censorship do you think and also you talk about you know it, the coward's email, as you call it, which is an email you got from somebody basically admitting that they're too timid to voice their opinion online, right? They'll email you saying, I wanted to comment supporting you, or I wanted to tell you this. And this happens all the time with people. They're too, too, too cowardly to speak out. Do you think 
that that is not only resulting in less people being honest with themselves and others, but do you think that's impacting comedy in that there are less people that are going to become comedians? Or do you think it's evened out by the imbeciles out there that are willing to go on stage and just say what the mob is thinking? The hashtag resist crowd that is resisting nothing because every dominant factor and force agrees with them. Um, well, shit. Yeah. Now, now I'm imagining what the, what the, you know, Venn diagram is between hashtag resist and yeah. you know, throwing Campbell's soup at a, at a, <laughs> that's the know. new comedy. It's, 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 a, very, it's, a, <laughs> it's Andy. What is it? Uh, Andy Kaufman. That's, that's yeah. what we're talking about. That's the new Andy Kaufman. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that, uh, you know, there's a real chilling effect and I, I think that it's hit, you know, all different modes of life, you know, from civilians who, you know, aren't comedians who, like you said, will reach out to me and say, oh, I really wanted to comment or I really wanted to like this, but I was afraid, you know, that there might be blowback, you know, at my job or, um, you know, in my social circle. Right. And for me to hear that, it's like, uh, you know, in a way I get it um, because I, I definitely lost friends, you know, mm -hmm. over the more outspoken I've been about, you know, about this stuff. Um, you know, so I, so I understand that fortunately for myself, you know, like, talking about you know earlier it's like but i've also been able to build a my work my, my my little world my little tribe um that i think extends out to also friends like like yourself like the people you know uh in the the liberty movement and all that so i never i never feel quite alone or as alone as maybe a lot of these people feel where it's like yeah they have they have nothing outside of like the people that they work with and, the, and their you know their close friends who they might you know deviate from when it comes to uh uh, comes to their belief. So, you know, their fear is real. And I think, I think, you know, that, that also trickles down into, into comedy as well. Um, I know a guy, uh, a, com a comedian who, you know, can't stand Trump, hates the fucking guy and would, you know, make, you know, Trump jokes and his side would be really happy with that. But God forbid he made a joke about a, you know, a democratic mayor or something like that. They'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? Like, take that. Like, not only is that is that um, you know uh, wrong for you to do that, it might hurt our side, and That's you right. should remove that. You know, so it's like you have people who are even getting that from their own side of the political aisle, and you know, I think you have to have some balls to be able to put up with that, or be like, hey, you know, uh, you know, if you don't like it, leave it. You know, I'm, I'm still going to continue to do this thing. And, um, yeah, I think, it, you know, I think all this stuff is sort of like set up, you know, tests for one another and also tests of your relate. It's tests of yourself, tests of your relationships. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see who, who comes out. You know, of it. Yeah. Well, you know, it kind of reminds you a little bit, like you're talking about people self-censoring because they don't want to ostracize their group, their mm -hmm. crowd. Right. And especially when it comes to comedy, um, or, or journalism. You know, both journalists and comedians are supposed to be speaking truth to power. But as you point out, so often they'll say, well, you're supposed to be punching up. You're supposed to speak truth to power. But these people aren't speaking truth to power. They're not punching up. They're punching down or they're punching laterally. And, you know, talk a little bit about that and that aspect of how you feel things are going right now. Because I especially like, as I said, this this punching up, punching down I, I don't know, false narrative, this this false measuring stick that people like to use when it in regards to comedy and what actual power means in comedy. Yeah, I think uh, something that I noticed, uh, you know, early on about, you know, punching up and, and punching down, it, it sort of went hand in hand with this message of speaking truth to power, you know. And at, at one point I, I was like, wait a minute, when did when did comedy become about speaking truth to power? Cause that's all I was hearing as opposed to just speaking truth. And, you know, what I realized is, well, you know, sometimes when you speak truth, things can get awkward because mm -hmm. that involves sometimes calling out people who, you know, might be of a protected class, people you're not supposed to make fun of ideas that you're supposed to um, accept or at least shut your mouth and not, you know uh, you know, not make fun of, you know, things that are beyond criticism or, you know, the new yeah. sacred cows and all that. And I, and I see that, you know, similarly with the whole, you know, uh, punching up and, and punching down thing. I think it's incredibly condescending to say mm -hmm. to somebody, look, I'm I'm sorry, but I you're below me. I, I can't right. make fun of you. You know, <laughs> that, was, that was my favorite part of that chapter. <laughs> it's like it's like, oh, my God, can you imagine saying that? 
Um, and it's almost I, like, you know, you see this evident in when people have handicapped comedians or, or handicapped audience members or something. And, you know, they'll, I can't make fun of you. Well, yeah, that makes me feel like shit. Thank you. I did. I did well, I did. Uh, I remember I did um, uh, an open mic once and one of the comedian who went before me had, I, I think, cerebral palsy. And mm. um, um, he got called up to the stage. It took him a while to get to the stage. And part of me was thinking how funny it would be if, like, he, he spent all of his time just trying to get to the stage. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it, just like, give it, him the light. <laughs> yeah, three to five. And then he's out, you know. Uh, uh, Hold but, on, wait, wait. Before you finish the story, I want to run an ad for 30 seconds. Sure. High level teaser, and we'll come back. The tree of liberty must be watered from time to time with the blood of tyrants. The official spirit of 1776. Smooth. Flavorful. Merlot. For any revolution, tyrants are losing their heads over this wine. Enjoy the taste of freedom. Drink the blood of tyrants. Order today at bloodoftyrants.wine. Save 10% with the code LIONS. Save 10%, Lou. Is that, is that legit? Is that, is that legit? Yeah, man. Yeah, that's legit. Yeah, blood of tons. I, I know. Wait, that, that is I'm, legit. I'm going to try that. That's a, That sounds fucking great, man. Hell um, yeah, dude. Okay, so say, finish telling us how you uh, you tripped this comedian with, uh, was it cerebral palsy? Did not trip him. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, so he got up and, you know, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was great seeing him up there, you know, you know, doing his thing, him trying, you know, trying comedy. Um, and he, you know, he did some funny stuff. Um, he got off the stage. I was up next and I forget what his name was. Um, but, uh, but when I got up there, I was like, man, you, you know, you're really fucking me up, dude, because my whole life I was, I've been told not to laugh at people like you <laughs> and here you are being a comedian, you know, and he was howling. Like he thought it was, you know, he, he thought that was, that was really funny. Um, you know, so that was, uh, that, that was cool. That, that was a, a, a you know, a, a cool moment there. Um, but yeah, you know, just getting into the, you know, back into the whole, you know, punching up, punching, punching down thing. It's just like, man, that sometimes, uh, I don't know, I just can't do the math and I'm not sure what yeah. the formula is and when I need to, you know, shut my mouth, you know? Yeah, dude. I mean, it is, it, it is interesting to see. You know, and a lot of comedy right now is not even, and you, and you also talk about Hannah Gatsby, right, in your in your book, wherein there's there's this whole math of punching up and punching down, but now we've gotten into a new era of comedy, which is arguably not comedy, but is instead, I don't know, soul bearing uh, confessions or a a, a therapy state a therapy session on stage, a, a bearing of your own uh, horrible interactions of the past labeled as comedy so what do you think about that yeah and I, and I you know i i talk about that you know before i i saw hannah gatsby's um special i would do um basically i would do any show that that, that would have me up you know any any opportunity i would have to be on a mic you know i would and also and, any show after watching the special to cleanse your palate you really <laughs> you need it's like gargling with scope got to do anything to get that taste out <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, so I, I would do shows where sometimes it would be like a mixed show of storytelling and stand up, Right. Mm -hmm. And one show in particular, I, I had worked on this, uh, on, on this comedic story about being newly single and thinking it would be a great idea that as I'm dating, you know, new women for me to have vibrators back at my apartment. <laughs> You know, so I like ordered vibrators uh, without without thinking like, no, this is going to gross out any chick that comes because they're going to come over and be like, are these new? Like, who the, f who the yeah, fuck? Yeah. How many people have these been in before yeah, me? Exactly. Uh, did you put them in the dishwasher at least? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I'm getting ready to tell, you know, this story about, you know, a newly single guy who's, you know, on his, you know, sexual escapades and misadventures and being you know, uh, you know, being like a dumb dude, you know, in, in some respects. <clears throat> and the woman before me, she's a storyteller and she tells a story about 
I don't know what was that with those bees that just so, popped. Sorry, no, I, I, I'm in this odd place. I should have just closed my fucking shades. I've been adjusting my lights this whole time because the sun. It's like the time we're recording this is like four to five my time. So the sun is going down. The lights changing drastically by the minute, and I keep adjusting my lights. So I turn it off, and like half my green screen went out. Oh shit! It would be funny if I got attacked by bees, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lions, the lions of liberty yeah. murdered by bees yeah oh bumble uh, that's yeah we'll, we'll finish this show talking about bumblebee man and canceling a poop by cool. the way so cool. so yeah finish finish up the story about your vibrating uh your experiences uh you lothario and then we'll get into that yeah my, my my two little uh my two little vibers i call them the twins and um uh, you know so i'm getting ready to tell this story and the woman who goes up before me she's a storyteller and she proceeds to tell a story about being raped and there's no comedy whatsoever there's no mm. punchlines nothing like that it's all about you know this terrible awful thing that she went through and you know the audience is listening to that and i'm listening to that and i i forget how it ended if there was some kind of epiphany that she had but it was, there was no there was like no light at the end of mm. that darkness and then i got to get up there and it's not like i could riff because you know, because anything would just be bad. And then I have to go and tell this fucking story that I have prepared I, about here, this. Lou. Here's what you do. <laughs> she comes off stage and you go on stage and you take the mic and you just go, look, I'm sorry. Get over it. Are you ever going to let it go? There you go. There you go. So I no. wish I wish I <laughs> I wish I had Brian McWilliams there to go up instead of me. So he could do that and <laughs> yeah, deal with exactly. whatever, whatever came his way. Um, do the follow up. But, but, you know, so, you know, at least on that show, it was a storytelling show. Um, you know, the booker probably had an idea on who, on what she was going to tell. Um, in, in Hannah Gatsby's example, you know, she spends like, what, a good like 15 to 20 minutes of, of her special, I believe, recounting a similar story of terrible sexual assault with no punchline or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, she had a really funny, she had a funny opener uh, in her next special, Douglas, where she's like, you know, like if you're here after seeing <laughs> Nanette, she's like, I don't know what's wrong with you, you know, uh, which <laughs> yeah. was a good, you know, it was a good, uh, a good joke, but I, I felt like she did something kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, did something kind of wrong to her audience you know it's sort of like tricking them in right to this getting them in the door in the seats uh promising a comedy show and then doing that to them in a way it was kind of a um a you know a version of 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 assault you know one that i would yeah. prefer you know obviously uh over you know a real you know what, what she actually went through but it's something like i don't know what you're trying to do necessarily you know i don't well, know what you're almost, trying to do with that it, it almost feels to me it almost feels cheap to me like a like a, a stunt in that you know if you've got a comedian that has cerebral palsy they can't really get around the fact that they have cerebral palsy right that's right. part of the if they want to do comedy they do comedy it feels like this is setting people up so you have to feel bad for her and by by virtue of feeling bad for her, okay now you have to laugh right it's almost setting people up where they feel guilted into laughing at her and now i look like a pumpkin i can't get my lighting right this episode by the way i can't get it right your lighting is messing up my lighting i'm wondering what i'm Dude, doing it is what is ha is it short it's like shorting out your light bulbs yeah i look, I just, so, I just, I look like donald trump right now this is fucking i went crazy. darker i went i went darker this time i have yeah. really red lips people point that out they're like what's up with your lips why are they so red i don't know gorgeous Thanks. That must be all the licking cranberry juice. Are you are you uh like in the dune? Are you partaking of uh what it's like that that little rhyme they do? It's like they drink this crazy red wine, the people that are the accountants in Dune. Dumb, it I... doesn't matter. All right, let's talk about a poo. Let's let's wrap it up on a poo and bumblebee cool. man. Cause I, I was so pissed off about a poo. And I know that you did a, a great interview with the guy. There's there's this man who, who made the, the film The Problem with the Poo, which I thought was idiotically one-sided and, and not taking in the broader cultural experience for many Indian Americans of, look, this is a stereotype based in reality. And many of us are proud to have, you know, thrived in this environment uh, of coming out of owning stores. So you did an interview with a, a guy who did a counter documentary, and then you did your own mini comedy documentary if you will about bumblebee man so tell us a little bit about that and then we'll wrap it up yeah yeah um I, um yeah I, I did an interview with ankit uh shukla 
um, and he wrote a, a book said, I love you, Apu, um, in, in response to uh, Hari Kondabalu's The Problem with Apu. Um, and I think, yeah, before I... Yeah, before I did that interview, I, I made a, uh, a parody with We The Internet TV called The Problem with Bumblebee Man, which is basically <laughs> um, uh, Hari Kondabalu, uh, you know, inspired me um, to become an activist and to call out uh, The Simpsons uh, for having a, uh, a horrific stereotype of my people. Uh, Hispanics who dress like bumblebees. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Hari Kondabalu just gave so much strength to the movement of adults who uh, are offended by cartoons. Um, and, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun making that, uh, making that fake uh, documentary, especially with the people who think it's real. That, that was my, I, that blew my mind. When I read that you said that people legitimately wrote, thought it was a true piece even though as you said in the book and, and in the sketch i mean the guys trying to people are like fetishists are trying to fuck bumble me man because that's their thing <laughs> somehow they took it seriously which yeah. shows you though where we're at as a culture of you know people's willingness to be offended and to buy into all this narrative that everything every, you know there that there's no good stereotype that can be mocked and that also that you know, the, the, my problem with the Apu thing, like I said, is, is twofold. It's number one, we talked about that many people identified with Apu. And number two, that you need to have the stereotype in order to play off the stereotype. You, you have to have the stereotype to showcase how you can grow out of that stereotype, right? And that mm -hmm. was Apu's role in The Simpsons. There were so many heartwarming moments of him as a stereotype showcasing the humanity, um, how you know the stereotype shortcomings, and also buying into the stereotype and making it even more ridiculous where you go, okay, this is so absurd in its face that obviously these people aren't like this. You can't have comedy making fun of that. You can't have cultural appreciation of how ridiculous a stereotype is if you don't ever address the stereotype. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the biggest problem, I guess, with um, with with a poo or at least that, you know, Hari uh, had with a poo was the voice. Um, so mm -hmm. it was a very stereotypical Indian uh, Indian accent played by Hank Azaria, who is not Indian. And so that was like, you know, one of the big driving forces, like here's a white guy doing a stereotypical Indian accent. And um, uh, uh, Azaria didn't appear in in Hari's uh, documentary, uh, thankfully. Um, uh, but, you know, later he came around to apologize for, you know, having voiced the poof, a poof for fucking 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so much so that he wanted to apologize to every Indian in the world. Like, that's like a billion that's, people, dude. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. while. Yeah, well, COVID I, helped. I, I mean, I, yeah, it took a few out. <laughs> Cut down uh, the number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And what was what was interesting is um, on YouTube, I found this video of uh, this YouTube channel went to Bombay, uh, Bombay, excuse me, uh, to uh, interview uh, people on, you know, people on the street in India to see what they thought of a poo. And some people liked it. You know, some people thought it was cute, funny. Some people thought it was kind of hacky. Uh, a couple of people were offended by it. But what was funny is that every single person interviewed kind of sounded like a poo and you know so it's just it's one of these things it's like like yo man like how could you have such a big problem with this stereotypical accent when you got like a billion motherfuckers who sound <laughs> like this fucking accent man you know and I, and I say that as somebody who my dad has an accent he's a very thick accent like he's from argentina but he has like this weird uh, it, it, like I've been told that he sounds Venezuelan, but he uses Mexican slang. So I'm like that. So he's got a wild <laughs> accent that I love that I think is, is fun. And, and I, I enjoy putting accents on and I enjoy when people do them as well. Then so. I just enjoy pudding. <laughs> it has been awesome having you on, man. Uh, you know, as difficult as the situation has been on both of our eyes with my lighting, it has been a long time coming to talk to you again. So congratulations on the book. Again, guys, you can find this book on Amazon. I'm not sure if you can you get it in, in physical locations as well, if, if those exist. Do those exist? I'm not physical sure. If, I'm not sure if any physical bookstores are, are holding it. I do know there's a bookstore called Sparta Books in New Jersey, and I think they have two copies of it. All so, right. Well, you know, regardless, want, who, yeah. who goes to them? Who, who right. goes to them? 
<laughs> All right, but again, yes, that joke isn't funny anymore. I highly recommend it. Honestly, I highly, highly recommend it. There's the cover, beautiful. It's got Lou on the cover when he was a uh, an army photographer during the Vietnam <laughs> War. And uh, again, Lou, tell everybody where they can find you online. Tell them about your podcast, all the good stuff. Yeah, so uh, you guys can find me on social media at the Lou Perez, and you could uh, check me out on my website theluperez.com so i'll have live dates there i'll be doing book signings and that sort of thing so uh check in over there and uh if you're interested in uh supporting my work i'm on locals locals.com theluperez.locals.com beautiful and you do you still do comedy sketches by the way i will say that right you're still you're still producing some sketches you've i've yeah. seen some on instagram and the like yeah dep depending on the budget if i uh if i don't have a budget then i use this uh, this yeah, phone. The old iPhone, and uh, if I do have a budget, well, then they look a little nicer. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, they're they're and it's awesome stuff, guys. So yeah, Lou Perez, awesome man, great catching up with you, buddy. Um, too long has gone between it, and I hope to see you again soon at uh, at Liberty themed events, or if you just happen to be popping through LA, man, you know I'm always here for you. Likewise, thanks, Brian. All right, everybody out there, thank you for tuning in to the podcast. You could have heard this earlier. You could have watched the stream and got it in advance, about a week in advance this time, by going to patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty. Uh, also, guys, you've got we've got our beautiful holiday season mug. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Taxation is Death from the Lions of Liberty. Get yours. A great gift. Lou, give one to your dad. You know, be so kind. Otherwise, that's it from me, Brian McWilliams, from Lou Perez, from the Lions of Liberty, and from Beanage Daydream. Keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head. <laughs>